we're into the um, third pasuk in the Shema, third verse. And these words shall be which I am commanding to you today these words that I'm commanding to you today should be should be on your heart. I mean, God had communicated to us thousands of years ago at Sinai. And yet it says, these words that I am commanding you today, when is today? When we say it, the words that I'm commanding to you should be on your heart. God speaking to us. But it's not today. This is something of the past going back 3,600 years ago. So what does it mean? the words that I am commanding you today. So the Midrash tells us, and Rashi cites a number of locations, that when we say the Shema and we study the Torah, it should be as if it was communicated today. What does that mean? So Rashi explains, in the name of the Midrash, that when you have a proclamation of the king, and it's a proclamation which ne was never heard before. And you hear it for the first time. It touches you in a way which is in a very unique way because you've never heard that proclamation. You haven't heard it before. But let's say every day they read the same proclamation. And it's something that you've heard multiple times over. When you hear that, those words, as much as you understand what those words mean, you're not touched the same way. Because you're aware and familiar with that proclamation. As we say, we've heard it before. We're aware of it. God is saying to Moshe, baby, to communicate to us. When you say the Shema, and you accept the dominion of God and you study the Torah, these words, they should be experienced and internalized as if they're being given today at Sinai. As we are today, uh, for the first time hearing these words, how to love God, how to study the Torah. It has to be as if it was given today and the expression of the words of the Midrash are, they should be in your eyes as if it's a new proclamation. For the first time it's heard. Because when you hear something for the first time, it has that uniqueness, that specialness, and you're touched in one of a, one of a way, kind of way, not as if something you've heard before. When we study the Torah, it has to be, as if it's for the first time we're hearing it. The first time we're experiencing this. You know, many years ago, when we first started the Yad of Ram at our own location, um, it was on 61st between Madison and Park, rented a space right next to the Regency Hotel. And We'd have classes there. I didn't give lectures there. There was a room, which was the closest thing to what it says in Perkyovos. Normally, it didn't have capacity to hold more than 35 people comfortably. I gave lectures there. We had 75 people. How did they fit in? I had no idea how they fit into that room, but somehow they fit in. And that was the beginning of our success in terms of what we represent, the dissemination of Torah. And I gave a class, and there's a person who was visiting from, he, he lived outside of Albany on a farm, and he would spend the whole week in New York, there's a hotel on Madison Avenue, it's called the Del Delmonico Hotel. 
the Monaco is between 61st and 62nd on the west side of the street. The Monaco Hotel, his father, he, he himself was a person then maybe close to 40. His father was a very wealthy man and they were in the textile business. And they had textile mills in Mexico. They used to bring in textiles from Mexico. And his family was up. They lived on this farm outside of Albany. And he would spend the whole week in New York. And somehow, and he was becoming observant. And he came to one of my Torah classes, Chumash classes. And he was part of a group that they would meet once a week in New York and was called Hasbara. They would speak and discuss concepts, to explain concepts. And he part, was part of his group for two hours. All these secular Jewish intellectuals, concepts of Torah, ethics, values, morals, whatever it was. He said to me, what I learned in a half an hour here I didn't learn in two years. Now the question is why? Smart people, intellectuals, PhDs, not ordinary, very educated people. You know, you could go in circles and spin your wheels and you could throw out all kinds of ideas. But the question is, what's concrete? What is real? You can entertain Endless things, endless positions. And I could refute every one of your positions or I could support every one of your positions. The question, but what is it? If you trace it to the source and the source is truth and then you elucidate that truth, you hear something that you've never heard before. And it was the first time he ever heard such a thing. And he was touched. And it touched him in a way that ultimately he became a fully observant Jew. And he moved from this farm outside of Albany, he moved to Muncie, New York with his family. And he sent his kids to the Jewish day school in Muncie. I think he still lives there. I'm not sure where he lives. Today, his children are married, whatever. But it has to be kechadoshos. You can't give it over. We've heard it before. We have a semblance We've heard a semblance of what you're saying. If that's the way you hear it, you take it with a grain of salt. You don't give it your fullest attention. Even if you give it its fullest attention, in what context are you processing it? Is this what it's really all about? Or is it something which to be considered? This is all hypothetical. These are all myths. You know, I never heard the concept of myth. When I met Michael Steinhardt for the first time, we discussed many things. He presented something to me was uh, mind-boggling. That the stories in the Torah, there were never such people. There was an Abraham, there was not, these are all myths. And these stories, it's only to communicate concepts. It's all mythology. I was like shocked. I mean, here our belief is that every word was communicated at Sinai to every Jew who stood at Sinai. The four million people, God openly communicated with them. Every word is the word of God. Moshe is God's spokesman, irrefutably God's spokesman. The word of Moshe is the word of God. And all of a sudden this person tells me that it's a bunch of hogwash. That's what he tells me. It's all myths. And what do you draw from it? You learn lessons. You know what lesson do you learn? That if by offer, when they need a sanitation system, make sure the water doesn't get polluted. It should be really secure deep in the ground because we have to do tikan, tikuna olam. We have to bring the world to perfection. Yeah, what's it, what it's all about? God says this. It's all, mytho it's all mythology. So what happened? I was taken aback and he says to me, you know, you're a provincial Jew. Do you know why? Because you never studied anthropology and all this other, and you don't have that special secular education. That's why you believe you took on this archaic position. You know what he tells me? I say, you know something, Michael? 
Nobody knows how to insult a person like yourself. But I can tell you, I have students that you can't hold a candle up to them in terms of what their education is, what their intellectualism and what their background is. And they disagree with you. They support my position. So evidently, it's not because I'm provincial, I'm backward, I'm archaic. It's evidently is because you have a few bucks in your pocket. That's the reason why you believe your word is truth and God's word is mythology, is all myths. Just telling you to give and take I had with them. Okay? So what happens? Somebody gives me a book, a gift. It's written by Johnson. It's called The History of the Jews. The History of the Jews is what? The book was written because it's called Judeo-Christian, that the foundation of Christianity is Judaism. So he wrote a book about Judaism to give us, to give the Christians an understanding of the, what the background, the backdrop of Christianity is. And I read the book, first 40 pages. What's it all about? It's about the Bible. There's a Christian writing this. And he writes and shows that every fact in the, in the book of Genesis, the great flood, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Ur Kazdim, the communities, the cities, they discovered through archaeology that every fact is fact, it's not myth. Because they discovered 20,000 cuneiforms, these clay tablets etched with the history, with all the facts that you find in the Bible. These were real people, these were real communities, and these were real events. And this guy's telling me that I'm some kind of backward nincompoop, that it's, I'm some kind of archaic guy who just walked out of a cave, and he, because he sits on a seat on, on, on Wall Street, he's God's gift to humanity. You got it? So what do I do? I had a relationship with him. I buy a book. I send it to him as a birthday gift. Let him eat his craw. Got it? That's how upset I was. When I saw it, the audacity and the chutzpah, this guy, you know, I send it to him. I meet him a few weeks later. I said, Michael, you get the gift, the book? He says, yeah. I says, he says, I, the truth is I didn't even, I, I realized you sent it, but I didn't even open the book. I said, why not? If I send you the book, evidently, I'm not just sending you a gift. The book evidently has something to do with our discussions. I said, why don't you open it? What you said is so baseless, it's almost insulting to, any, to one's intelligence. Everything I said is proven by all the archaeologists. And you're telling me I'm a backward guy because I never studied anthropology and archaeology. That's the reason why I assumed this position of uh, this provincial position. You understand? You know what the answer is? It doesn't make a difference. Because if you want to believe what you want to believe, you can take it all, sweep it on the carpet and just throw it out the window. That's its value. But if you understand, this is, this is the declaration of the king, the king of the universe. And it's something you never heard before. When you hear that with those words and you hear the dictate of the king, who he is and what he is, you know what you do? You tremble in your boots. Out of reverence, out of awe. This is the creator speaking to you. Hayom, every one of us, thousands of years later, we have to experience and be touched every day. We say the Shema twice a day. We study Torah continuously. Every time we engage in God's Torah, God says the only way you can be affected and touched by it is only if you experience it as if it's the first time you've heard it. And only then will it make a difference in your life. Otherwise, it's abstract intellectualism. Otherwise, it's old hat. On your heart. And again, this is the alibcha. It's a double base. We spell why it's grammatically, it should say libcha, one base. The vavcha means the positive inclination and the negative inclination. You know, it's interesting. We read at Sinai, God put the mountain over our heads. And we said, Nasa bin Nishma. First, we say, Nasa bin Nishma. And God puts the mountain over our heads. And the Talmud tells us that 
when he put the mountain over heads and he says, either you accept the Torah or you'll be buried under the mountain, we didn't have much of a choice. So we accept it. So Mason Rutvinsk says, it doesn't mean God actually put the mountain over our heads, but it was the equivalent of that. Why? Now, what is choice? Choice means I present two situations to you. And because it's not razor sharp, clear, black and white, there's some vagueness, which is the more correct. And you see an alternative and you're not sure which is the right correct direction to go. So now you have to make an evaluation. You have to make a choice. What about if the, the discernment between the two was so clear, one is right and the other was wrong? It's to say a person, either you walk through the door and you see solid ground for the next thousand feet, and if you take the left exit, you go off the cliff. Is that a choice? Which, which, which door are you going through? The, the exit, which you have solid ground to support you, or out the door, the left, where you go off a cliff? It's not a choice. When God presented himself at Sinai to us, it was with such absoluteness, we have no choice but to accept. It's We were forced to accept. God didn't give us a choice. He presented himself at such an irrefutable, but beyond irrefutable reality, we had to accept it. That was the level of clarity we, 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 we achieved. It was the equivalent. We had no choice. When you say the Shema, that was the Sinai experience. When you say the Shema, and you say these words, the dominion of God, the levels of commitment, the study of Torah. When you study those words, it's as if you're hearing him today, as if we were in Sinai. When we heard those words at Sinai, the Ten Commandments, directly from God, or Moshe being God's spokesman, and we prophesied, what was the level of clarity? There was no question. It definitely is the word of God. If God is asking us and telling us that you have to re-experience that reality every day, how's it possible? That was then, this is today. It's been 36, 500 years since then. Today, we're not at that level of clarity. We have so many questions. There's so much vagueness. It's literally monumental. It's like moving mountains to be able to come to that level of truth. But yet, the Torah tells us, when you study the Torah, when you accept the mitzvahs, when you do them, it should be like the first time. So should you should be touched in that special way, as if it's today. Evidently, what God is saying, you should know it's understood. And we say this. Any Jew who says today or ever that he's observant because he gets it. He has something other people don't have. It's his intellectualism, it's his acumen, it's his grasp, it's the ultimate level of arrogance. It's arrogance. Could you imagine a person stands in front of a tidal wave, in front of a tsunami, in front of a, a typhoon, in front of a hurricane, and you're not swept away and crushed by the force of that water? Is it possible? Personally, no. I was able to stand there. And I was not touched by it. I was not swayed by it. You know something? Either you're lying or you experienced a revealed miracle. It's impossible. The influences of our society. We're talking about what comes through our windows, what comes into our emotions, what we touched, our senses. We're being literally, the word bombarded is an understatement. At a, every level, Subliminal level, obvious level, whether it's the music, whether it's the perspectives, whatever it is, the level of corruption at every level, how we not totally destroyed and our spirituality just corrupted and perverted. You know what the answer is? It's called divine protection. Every Jew who's an observant Jew, it's only due to, to God's intervention to create some level of barrier protection that despite that, you're able to maintain your equilibrium, rel relatively speaking, 
to be observant or to be believing. It's not possible any other way. That's a miracle we all experience every day, to remain observant. If God says, when you experience Torah, you should experience as if it was given today, with that level of clarity, where you're able to achieve a level, you know, you've given up your choice. You're able to draw with that level of clarity. That's called divine intervention. Without it, it's not possible. Because how could we experience something today, thousands of years later, as if we're experiencing on the day that was given? Not possible. The answer is, it's possible if God intervenes, if you have that divine intervention. Every one of us has continuous divine intervention. Otherwise, we'd fall on deaf ears. And you talk to me, the way that person spoke to me says, I'm a provincial, archaic, backward Jew. And he's convinced. And he can't be moved. Even if he's hit over the head. And when he's hit over the head, he says, I hear what you're saying. Tomorrow, I'm starting from square one again. As if we never had the previous conversation. That's how little did it penetrate. But that's Hayom. The Chavitz Chaim makes a very interesting point. It's cited really by someone else. The Talmud tells us <coughs> that the evil inclination, which we're continuously involved with 24 7, every moment of our lives, Chavitz Chaim says regarding a fly, if a fly comes and buzzes in front of your face, what do you do? You swish it away. What does it do? Does it go away? It doesn't go away. Unless you kill it, it doesn't go away. It goes behind you. <coughs> when it goes behind you, again, you swish it away. It goes to the other side of you. As much as you swish it away, it never goes away. The evil inclination, if it doesn't succeed on one approach, it has endless approaches. And you have to always be ready to be confronted with those challenges to swish it away. Because you will never destroy it because as long as you're alive, we're subject to his machinations. That's the Chavetz Chaim. But the Talmud tells us regarding the evil inclination, it says, every day the inclination is mischachus olav. It's like a new approach. There's a renewal of the evil inclination every day. The other one says, no. Every day, the evil inclination overwhelms us. What is it, what's the difference if it overwhelms you or it presents, it's like it approaches you with a newness. So one of the commentators explains it this way. You know, years ago, when people smoked and they wanted to stop smoking, how did they do it? So they were suggested, you smoke Years ago, one of the popular brands was Kent. Kent was a popular brand cigarette. So people would smoke Kent. They say, you know something? And then cigarettes cost 27 cents a pack, 32 cents a pack. So you could afford it, okay? So they would say, if you smoke a pack a day or you're a chain smoker, smoke five packs in one day. You smoke five packs in one day, two days, you're not smoking anymore because you can barely breathe after you finish smoking 10 packs in two days. Then you don't have to go to cold turkey because just to be able to breathe, you're not going in there, there smoking anymore. That was the therapy, how to stop smoking. Okay? A person is married every day. His wife comes home after a hard day. He wants to sit down, relax, enjoy supper every day. His wife has the same food cooked. It's on the table. She cooks once a week, Saturday night, till Friday morning. He's eating that same food. Comes home. He says, you know, I'm sick and tired of this food already. How much can I eat this food? I'm married 40 years. It's come out of my ears. It's gone into my ears. It's gone out of my ears. How can I deal with it? You get sick of it after a while. You reach your, your maximum absorption point, and then it starts coming out of your pores. But yet, the evil inclination, every time you sin, 
The next time, you never get tired of sinning. It's like the first time you've sinned. He has an ability to somehow entice you as many times as you've done that sin. Every time you do it, it's like for the first time. There's a renewal. He presents it with a renewal as if it's the first time. That's the power of the evil inclination. With the same gusto, with the same indulgence, you'd say, you know, it's enough. I've been here before. It's like the first time you've been there. You've never been here before. God forbid. But he has that ability. So it's interesting. What is the antidote to the evil inclination? God says, I've created the evil inclination. That's the challenge of life. And because you challenge, that's where you have free choice. And if you succeed, you're on top of the mountain. But you have to have the weaponry to deal with that evil inclination. I've created the inclination. The only antidote that could incapacitate it is the Torah itself. There's no other antidote. So if the evil inclination approaches you with a newness, as if you never experienced it before, how do you have to counter it with that antidote to, to destroy it or to incapacitate it? If you approach it with Torah, which is like old hat, not with an excitement, not with an insight, not with an all-consuming feeling that every aspect of your emotion and your intellect is touched. You think you could stand up against that temptation? No way. So the same way he approaches you with that newness, representation of evil, as if you never experienced it before, you come with the latest advanced weapon to vaporize it. With that same newness, new weapon, it's called Torah. It's called Torah straight off Sinai. What they used to say, hot off the press. Used to have the newspaper boys. Read all about it. You got to read it all about it. It's new. And you've never heard it before. That's where you have to experience it. And only when you approach it with that newness, now we're going toe to toe. We're going toe to toe with evil inclination. Because anything less than that, he's going to hoodwink you. He'll strangle you in a way you won't even realize that he's taken over your life. Therefore, it's for you, Adoram Hayom. You have to experience as if it's today. Because when you engage in it with that newness, you really have no choice. You've ch achieved a level of clarity. Like at Sinai, they have no choice because that was the level of clarity. Through the antidote of Torah, experience it at that level, you've achieved a level of clarity where there's not even consideration. You're going to end up in the clutches of the evil inclination. You're just going to push it away and you're going to walk that straight path. That's what the word Hayom is connoting to give us the best advice in, in life, but it's not so simple. It's a mindset. It's a, it's a background. You have to understand its value. When you understand your life is dependent on it, there's no, you, you pull out all the stops and you give it your best. And literally, the evil inclination doesn't let up for a moment. Not for a moment. What we see, what we hear, what we talk, what we think. Unless you're always spiritualizing yourself. You know, you go into a sterile area. You see these people, they, they look like they're wearing spacesuits. And you have to bathe in a, in a certain type of solution. It has to be bacteria-free, everything free. Because you can't go into that environment if you have any traces of whatever that is. This world is full of all those antigens, all these bacteria, all this infectious waste. Now, how do you protect yourself? What do you coach yourself with? Now, what's the protective co covering which repels it, which deflects it? When you study Torah with that newness, you merit that divine intervention to create this protection, and therefore you're able to deflect every approach of the evil inclination.